Welcome to this webinar entitled Climate Change Adaptation Financing for Central America and the Caribbean. This webinar is organized by the Inter-American Institute for Global Change Research, the IAI, the UN Environment Program, and also PLOS Climate. The webinar is being recorded and we will upload it to our social media and our YouTube channel. Now I would like to give the floor to Maria Teresa Abogado, uh, who is a UNEP representative. Welcome, Maria Teresa. Hi, thank you. Good morning, good afternoon from Montevideo on behalf of the UN Environment Program and its Adaptation Unit in the Latin America and Caribbean office. I would like to thank you your invitation because we can make a few comments to kick off this uh, post-COP27 event on a very important topic, which is uh, climate change adaptation financing. First of all, we would like to acknowledge the work of all our IAI and Close Climate colleagues in organizing this session. Thank you very much. As we have seen in 2022, we've had tropical cy uh, cyclones through the Caribbean and they uh, have had a terrible effect, also terrible um, flooding in Honduras, Brazil, Colombia, etc. Terrible droughts that have led to several agricultural issues in Uruguay. This, all of this reminds us that climate change is not for the future, it's happening now. In our region, we've had a total of, of 175 disasters in the last two years. And of the 175, almost 90% uh, were of meteorological, climate and hydrological origin. These events amounted to 72% of financial losses. Also, these events are more frequent and more intense nowadays. So this means that millions of people are now uh, economically uncertain in the world. And this also leads to higher multidimensional poverty water and food insecurity, and it has several uh, other impacts. From the UNEP, we support the countries from the region so that they can uh, uh, provide their climate change adaptation strategies. We also support them in capacity building so that they can effectively implement these strategies according to a different context. And we do this by piloting technology, promoting institutional coordination mechanisms and also innovative financing mechanisms. Of course, uh, climate financing was one of the main topics at the COP27 and it remains a barrier to take action. Uh, in 2020, annual adaptation costs in developing country amounted to approximately $70 billion. And this figure is expected to reach uh, in a wide range the between 280 and $500 billion in only 30 years. These estimates, of course, exceed the, the resources of the international cooperation system and the public sector as well. So we need the private sector in order to reach our adaptation objectives. However, and we know this, uh, practical knowledge about how this can be done, this participation is quite limited. In October, we have the opportunity to organize a regional conversation before the COP27. We talked about the, the need to strengthen financial mechanisms for adaptation and we also needed to formalize the losses uh, and harm uh, mechanism uh, because of climate change, especially in the region. We are here to listen to the governments and to the academia. We'd like to know which messages you've, you've um, obtained from the COP27 and also how this is important for the region. So hopefully we will be able to develop initiatives to improve our knowledge so that we can continue having a debate. And most of all, they should help us take action. Thank you. Thank you, Maria, for your words. 
um, and they are very much in line with today's event. Thank you to the amazing panelists we have today, the moderator and the panelists, and they will be sharing their experience and knowledge today. Um, we'd like to tell you that this is the second in a series of three webinars as organized by the Inter-American Institute for Global Change Research at Bloss Climate. The next one is on Thursday, Thursday about the, uh, the role of the IPCC in science policy processes. You're all invited. Now I would like to introduce a moderator. It is a pleasure to have Ana Maria Lobo Guerrero with us. She studied uh, economics at the University of Andes in Colombia. She has a PhD in economics as award, awarded by the University of California, Los Angeles, UCLA. She's currently the Research Climate Action Director at Biodiversity International in the International Center for Tropical Agriculture. Before that, Ana Maria was the Research Director in Policies at the CGAIR in climate change, agriculture and food security. She has contributed to the agricultural sector in Latin America, including management and the risk associated with climate variability, and also implementing sustainable practices that adapt to climate in order to reduce food insecurity. Ana Maria has also supported these processes whereby policy makers and decision makers use climate related information and tools to design and implement plans and strategies. Before working with the uh, uh, Food Security Climate Change Plan, she worked at the National Department of Colombia as a climate change coordinator. In her position, Ana Maria led the development of the Colombian Climate Change Policy, National Adaptation Plan, the Climate Change Research Agenda. She also coordinated the technical support of the development strategy regarding low carbon emissions. Ana Maria has worked a lot in research as she has focused on how science can have an influence on policy making and also in building and comparing different types of economic models to evaluate the consequence of adaptation and also mitigation to help countries develop economically. Thank you. Welcome, Ana Maria. Thank you, Maria Inés, for this introduction. I am very happy to be here facilitating this important conversation. I think that at the beginning we already talked about the importance of these topics given the, the figures we have and also the impact on people. Therefore, I am very happy to facilitate this conversation. We have a, an amazing panel. And I would like to start by introducing our first panelist. Our first panelist is Natalie Flores. Natalie, since 2018, has been a Dominican Republic delegate before the UN Convention uh, on Climate Change. Working for climate change and during this opportunity, she had the opportunity to work with a legal arrangement in terms of mitigation and adaptation to climate change uh, in the private sector in order to work with the climate change uh, effects for the Dominican Republic. In the climate change of the Ministry of Environment and Natural Resources of the Dominican Republic, she worked for the Economic Development Plan for uh, climate change. Natalie also had the opportunity to work in the National Committee for the Environment and the Environmental Committee for the Constitution of the Dominican Republic, where you can have the approach to climate change. So as you can see, we have a very uh, luxurious panelist with us. Uh, you have uh, the time allocated for your presentation. Good morning, everyone. Ana Maria. Good morning, Maria. It is a pleasure to see you, and it is uh, a pleasure to join the IAAI team that organized this meeting. And I'm happy to see so many people that I have worked with regularly. 
uh, with our colleagues for the U environment and the UN colleagues. We have several <laughs> topics to deal with, but I would not like to say that this is the most important. It's the one that has to do with the development of capabilities for the implementation and adaptation of climate change in the Dominican Republic. In the Dominican Republic, as you mentioned, when you mentioned about our experience has uh, oh, in the 2010 constitution, a specific article that states that we have the right and the obligation to develop in a sustainable way, keeping in mind adaptation to climate change. And for us, this means uh, a significant issue because we relate that to our commitments before uh, the UN climate change framework and with the agreements such as the Paris Agreement that has been working with the existing framework since then. The fact that we are already working at this level in order to implement and reach the funding perspective for climate change and how that shows uh, within the national um, institutions and not just for the government institutions, it also pertains to the private sector and how we work with this legal environment as well. The Dominican Republic also has a law that is our sustainable development strategy that has to do with the sustainable development goals. And this is the only law that is a legal tool to include uh, a reduction emission quota in the Dominican Republic. Specifically, it includes the approach of adaptation to climate change. It's important to mention this when we mention when we talk about funding, because when we deal with international negotiations and the specific framework of the UN on climate change, what we see is we see that as an international forum. We see that as an instant where the government present results. We see the private and private sector, sector, et cetera. However, when we go to the negotiation tables and we discuss the issue of how to manage funding for our countries and state institutions, this is where we can draw the financial tools to implement it. Because if it is not written, it will not have a mandate within the national legal framework. So my expertise actually is not uh, funding, it is public policy and specifically the climate diplomacy, that this is what I've uh, um, done my whole life. But in spite of this, I believe that it's essential to consider that from this perspective, that is, what do negotiators consider when they include funding for a specific issue? And what are the implications of that demand? in Latin America, uh, in Latin America, uh, because how do we lower funding specifically? Sometimes when we meet for a conference of the parties, when we've met for a week, we have discussed different issues, for example, the Dominican Republic belongs to the smaller insular countries and we require funding due to our vulnerability level. We also belong to the Central America and the Latin American uh, coalition and associations. There, we see different needs converge 
uh, in, for example, in the coalition for the forest coalition for the Americas, we usually meet and we approach the issue of nature based decisions in that regard. But the funding from the private sector, it is included in international decisions, for example, uh, in the issue of the market, how can we fund what we need so that the owners of the forests don't cut off uh, the, the forest itself. And of course, uh, I came now from the COP with a view that is a little bit ambitious. Actually, I would like to mention Maria Teresa because when we talk about the adaptation plan for the Dominican Republic, we would like to include our bases, our foundations, but they will certainly ask us, what is the purpose? What is the funding? How will we be able to have access to, this, to these funds? So the commitment is essential so that we can uh, put it on paper, right? If we don't put it on paper, we will not be able to include any of the other cross-cutting issues. We are actually trying to promote the language in Dominican Republic so that this funding uh, includes uh, the vulnerabilities when we talk about environmental policies. Because, um, at the end of the day, when we want to have specific funding from international cooperation, the most vulnerable countries usually don't have access to this investment. We had a delegation uh, of about 27 people, including the Minister of Environment and Natural Resources. We also uh, discussed this with the Coordination for Climate Adaptation. And for the group, uh, he coordinated the view uh, from that perspective. Also, our vice minister that could not um, come today, she's a spokesperson for the smaller insular states uh, council groups uh, so that she and she has been the one to carry out the advocacy to show how small insular countries needed to create this fund. But now we have a greater uh, uh, task ahead. We have to make this fund work. It has to be operational. It needs to have a board. Um, ideally, we would be able to receive the funding uh, through um, as small insular countries that that was what we had been requesting since the very beginning. In terms of technology transfer, we have similarly insisted on funding and capacity building. Um, in capacity building, uh, we have worked with the biggest China climate change group and we defended the priorities for capacity building so that we could um, promote funding from that perspective as well. So uh, the idea is to generate culture, uh, is to have three pillars if we, for some reason don't have some of these legs, funding social support or sustainability, we will not be able to create uh, the right uh, policies. We would like to honestly stop um, exercising or implementing coercive measures um, 
we would like to have the right funding. We would like to receive the approach so that adaptation is understood. I can speak a lot more about this, but um, I don't want to take too much up too much of your time but i would like to tell you that we are very happy to have had one of the youngest delegations most of our delegates were between 23 and 30 years of age they have worked very hard uh, within this framework of transference and the public and private sector. And there, the importance of the local funding so that small and medium-sized companies can relate through these public and private partnerships, through training, through public policies, so that as of 2022, uh, all of us who took this master's degree on, on funding of public policies and climate change can work together so that we can relate the scope that we've had in terms of technology transfer and capacity building and how funding becomes essential to be able to achieve our goals. I would like to leave my um, participation here right now, and I remain at your disposal. Thank you, Natalie. I would like to also mention the, important, the importance of climate funding, not just for partnerships, but also for capacity building. That is so important to be able to build climate resilience. Thank you for mentioning that, the issue of the need of funding and the need of capacity building. Let's move on right now to our next speaker, Elena Pereira. She's a specialist in climate funding. She has over 10 years in international uh, development in the public uh, sector in issues of mitigation and adaptation of climate change. Elena is part of the Plan A project and supports the government of Honduras in terms of a funding policy for the commitments of adaptation and the contributions at national level. Since 2021, Elena has supported the government of Honduras uh, within the UN Climate Change um, a council working specifically in climate change in COP uh, in Egypt and in the just finished COP um, uh, meeting we all shared. You have the floor right now and then uh, we will have a few minutes for questions. Thank you, Ana Maria. Good afternoon, good morning. Thank you for the invitation. I would like to tell you a little bit of our experience in, in Honduras with the national adaptation plans and with the updated networks that they already include uh, an item regarding adaptation. The Honduras National Adaptation Plan has been jointly implemented by the civil society the public sector, it was published in 2019. Then we had the pandemic and that put a pause to this adaptation plan. My project, it's a, a UMPD, a NAP readiness program. And this project, deals with the adaptation strategic planning. We already have our plan. We, in the NDC, we already have the commitments drawn and they were set up into five strategic areas. This is the food and agribusiness sector, human health, 
infrastructure, biodiversity and ecosystems and water resources. These are the priority adaptation systems. This project tries to carry out strategic planning through an, in, an interinstitutional framework at central level so that the implementation of the national plan can take place. How do we do this? We are working with the heads of the different departments. I work at government at regional and local service together with the civil society. And that includes the Secretary of Environment, the Institute of Forestry Conservation, the Agricultural Department, and the Secretary of Finance. Why the Secretary of Finance? Because that involves the strategy and how the financial strategy plays a significant role to ensure funding for capacity building for the adaptation plan. The other issue of the implementation plan has to do with sectorial adaptation strategies in infrastructure, for example. For example, two years ago, we were affected by two hurricanes in two weeks, Eta and Yota. And those hurricanes led to significant damage. And we lost uh, road infrastructure. Uh, so that sectorial strategy became really important and the other one in the water resource system that also goes hand in hand with the uh, climate uh, events we've had. We have areas of the country that have very strong droughts and then very strong floods. These two extreme situations in one country that had to be approached differently. The other important aspect of strategic planning has to do with the regional strategies and with the reality of the different countries in adaptation terms. For that, we worked with the strategic planning department, integrating the adaptation uh, plan with the national adaptation plans. That was very important to, to do. Then the other component that was also important is the one that has to do with the funding itself. For us, um, and we saw this, that many countries have identified their priorities in terms of adaptations and they and need, they know what they need, but these needs are not funded because they have been budgeted. This is an important need that developing countries have. First of all, because they don't have a budget, they don't know how much it will cost, but also because they're going through renegotiation processes such as the new, uh, climate uh, change budget, if these countries don't know how much these adaptation uh, policies will cost, it will be very difficult to allocate funding to these measures. We are at the moment budgeting the adaptation plan together with the national climate funding policy. This will include the strategies from the different sectors, but also the adaptation sector. And in order to do that, we are exploring the role of international cooperation, but also to see what are the financial innovative tools that we will use. 
So we are considering from the financial department's perspective, what are some debt changes we could make to consider climate changes? We are exploring the possibility of exchanging debt by uh, climate projects, green bonds to create a green taxonomy so that we can transfer these funds to adaptation. And then, as Natalie mentioned, to consider the carbon markets and how the forestry sector can participate um, as well as a coalition for tropical forests, the network mechanisms uh, to be able to meet to meet the objectives uh, that we set in Colombia for the forestry sector. This is another uh, significant issue that we are uh, considering into the climate change broader issue. It's important that we do have an investment plan um, because we are at the moment prioritizing the project. This is based on the adaptation access with a cost effectiveness analysis. And they end up in a project pipeline ready to be funded. This is important within the framework of what we called uh, the climate funding perspective. As of 2025, the developed countries commitment that they have will include to annually contribute with $100 million. This has been actually set up in 2010 and it was never actually uh, executed. We hope that this tool, we hope that the contribution is, is um, greater, not only that it's executed, but that it is increased and that it meets the priorities of the developing countries. And if we as countries have not identified and budgeted these needs, we will not be able to have access to this funding that is coming to us. So even though we want to have a more ambitious transnational goal, we do need to improve our access levels. And in order to do that, we need quality funding in terms of adaptation so that um, especially for developing countries, uh, we can adapt uh, because in countries where we have adaptations, they are not fundable. They don't have enough return on, on, inv on investment. So we are trying to, so far this has been solved through subsidies. Um, that's why we need to clarify our objectives to budget so that they could be funded through projects like the ones I mentioned. I would like to leave my presentation there for the moment and then we can come back to this. Thank you, Elena, for telling us about the information needed so that we can have access to that climate funding is not just to say that there are needs, we have to budget, analyze and quantify specifically those needs. So thank you for informing us about that agenda. Let's go to our last presenter of the day, Nora Lambrecht. She is the climate risk officer in the environmental, social and corporate environment invest corporation for IADD. 
Nora will tell us a little bit more from the perspective of the private sector. She worked in circular economy and climate change. And before that, she worked in the uh, European Union Council. Nora is a member of the Global Shapers Community that is an initiative of the World Economic Forum. Nora, you have the floor. Uh, we have solved the uh, interpretation problem. You have seven minutes. So if you want, you can make your presentation in English. Great to be with you. So um, yeah, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to talk a little bit more about the um, private sector angle in Latin America and the Caribbean. And I'm going to talk a little bit about the status quo where we see from um, IDB Invest's perspective, currently the state of play. Um, I'm also going to talk a little bit about our own approach to climate risk assessment and adaptation finance. And then lastly, um, give a little bit of an outlook of what we want to do in the future, because I think as we've also heard from, from the panelists today, we're we're on the way, but there is so much more to be done. And I think this is also what we see very clearly. So um, yeah, I think we've heard there's this large adaptation finance gap in Latin America and the Caribbean. And on the one hand, the public sector has this critical role through, of course, the, the Paris Agreement process, but also just through, through its role of um, protecting citizens, communities has this critical role. But on the other hand, the private sector can also play a crucial part. And we see this in three different ways. So on the one hand, we see the private sector as enablers of adaptation. We are seeing that there are pure play adaptation um, companies that are actually arising, for instance, providers of early warning systems, for instance, providers of resilient building materials, providers of water efficiency solutions. So, so this enabling part, then on the other hand, also financers of adaptation, we see that there's a strong business case for adaptation. So the commercial, commercial banks are also realizing this opportunity or at least starting to, even though the focus is still very much on mitigation, but I think they're starting to realize the focus on adaptation also after the adaptation COP now. And then lastly, of course, every company needs to climate proof its own business. So the private sector also has this huge role in terms of um, making sure that their own operations, that their own supply chains, their stakeholders are climate resilient. And I think in that regard, um, what we are seeing with our clients often is that what they are doing, they don't necessarily dub it as climate adaptation but they just see it as sound or as smart business. So for instance, in the agribusiness sector, what we see with some of our clients is that they have, um, they have really understood, I mean, weather, weather is there like everyday life for millennia, right? But they, they are noticing these, these changes the, um, in the climate. And for instance, we have one client, one client that is already using drip irrigation systems that has built a water reservoir that is now lasting them three months in case of a prolonged drought. And they have never called any of this climate adaptation. So we visited them and we said, okay, well, what, what, what are all the things that you're doing? Um, this is clearly climate change adaptation. And they said, no, this is not climate change adaptation. This is just, this is just how we survive and this is how we do business. And I think, of course, both, both of these statements are very true. Um, but I guess what we also see is that not, not all clients necessarily have the, have the capacity. This was a reasonably big company, I have to say. Um, and not all the clients have the kind of resources to do this. So um, we also see that we as IDB Invest or the uh, multilateral development banks in general, we really have a key role enabling our clients that are still learning about the impacts of the climate crisis to share those best practices, to offer technical assistance on adaptation measures. And I think one thing that we've heard here over and over again is that we, can, that we need to offer the financing. We really need to give the right financing instruments because there are so many challenges tied to financing adaptation. On the one hand, we know that the benefit cost ratios of, of, of adapting are between two to one, 10 to one. Um, I think that's, that's research from the Global Center on Adaptation. But on the other hand, there's this time lag often. So we will, for instance, um, 
we will be financing a project, say, for five years, but the impacts might only materialize in 10 or in 20 years. So then making sure that the financing instrument is such that the payback times aren't too long and that it makes business sense today, even though the benefits of that investment are only materializing in the future. I think this is, this is where really concessional finance, where blended finance um, plays a key role. And on the other hand, I think with some clients, it's also just about changing the vantage point, really. Um, what we are often doing is that we're just helping clients see their business and the risks and the opportunities tied to that um, through a climate change lens. So, um, and this really helps also offer the right incentives, have the right conversations. And in the end, we see that this is often really um, creates this impulse for action. Um, let me talk a little bit about overall IDB Invest's approach to um, climate risks. So what we've been doing is that we really see climate risk assessment, this identification of impacts and what does it actually take? What do you actually need to adapt to? That we see this as the basis for what needs to be done. So we have a climate risk assessment methodology that covers three stages and we apply that to all of our um, direct investments now. So it's not just when we have specific adaptation interventions, when we are doing specific adaptation financing, but in general, we really see this as part of safeguards, making sure that every investment has say like a minimum level of um, capacitation, of capacity of resources and of knowledge. And the measures that we will then ask the client to take can really be everything from soft to hard measures. So um, sometimes generally what we will be asking clients as part of our investment process to do, for instance, is to embed climate change related risks into their risk matrix of their environmental and social management system. So to really mainstream that and integrate that, because even if the risks right now are not pressing, there is, usually this expectation and there is this exposure also given our region that um, they will materialize and that they will become more pressing going forward. And then in other cases, we are also asking for hard measures for infrastructure investments. There, there might need to be changes in the design. There might need to be some climate proofing. There might need to be an engagement um, with suppliers. Um, so, but what we've done so far is that um, with this, let's say, new process, we've had this new process for, for about two years now, we've screened over 100 transactions. And one of the outcomes that we're really seeing, I think given the region, most of these transactions tend to have moderate or high exposure to climate related risks. So it's really not that, that any company or any private sector client can say, okay, climate change, this, does, this doesn't affect me. This doesn't bother me in one way or another. It, bothers or affects almost everyone, whether that's in terms of, you know, what I was saying, like sea level rise, hurricanes, or if it is about heat waves affecting the workers, for instance, it's also these issues that really can have an impact on the private sector. Um, so let me let me close perhaps with some thoughts of um, what we're trying to do moving forward. Um, we want to, um, in the future, I think financing came through here a lot, and we are also recognizing that we want to create better financial and fit for purpose financial products that includes also offering pricing differentials that goes also hand in hand with this idea of incentives for adaptation. Um, we will, um, we have made a commitment to become Paris aligned as IDB invest, and that means um, making sure that all of our investments uh, do not go against the resilience and adaptation goals of the Paris Agreement. And then lastly, one thing that we're also looking into is extending the application of, for instance, climate events clauses to make sure that when our clients have a climate event, they don't get into financial trouble. And I'll leave it there. Thank you so much. Muchas gracias, Nora, por, eh, por, por contarnos la importancia y... Thank you, Nora, for describing the importance of the private sector in the climate change risks and the opportunities with the private sector. And you very well said it. The private sector operations uh, sometimes tend to overlook this agenda. We only have five minutes left. I would like to ask a question to Nora and one question to Elena of the questions we have received in the chat. For Elena, we have a question 
about what you said about adaptation to climate change in Honduras. And the question is if you will select one of the priority sectors of the five priority sectors that you mentioned. And for Nora, the question is, is it possible for you to expand about the risk management methodology that you have to assess risks? So let's start with Elena, please. We have four minutes, so be brief. Thank you, Ana, for your question. When we updated the NDC out of the five sectors, we prioritized four of them. And what we're doing now is out of the different secretariats, departments that are involved in the different sectors, we are identifying what are the priority areas that we must identify to be funded so that they could meet the requirements of the climate funding policies, and then to see what are the financial mechanisms that we will be able to use in order to fund them. Thank you, Elena. Nora, about the methodology. I respond in English, right? Yes, okay, okay, just checking. Um, so we have a three-step methodology that we apply to our investments and it's, um, it's anchored in our sustainability policy. So it's really a requirement that we apply that. And it's these three stages. So the first stage is screening where we take stock. We take stock of the climate hazards. We do a um, location-based screening of the assets of the company, and then we classify the transaction into low, medium, or high risk. And this is also where I was saying that most of our transactions tend to be medium or high risk, because they tend to be climate hazards and they tend to be relevant for those um, transactions. And then for the medium and high risk transactions, we go into further analysis and we leverage, for instance, project specific documents. So, for instance, for infrastructure investments, we will often ask for independent engineer reports. So we ask those independent engineers to look also at the engineering and structural design through a climate lens. And then the last stage is really the managing of the risks part. So making sure that the client has the mitigants in place to um, to manage to become more resilient to those risks. And if they don't have them yet, then we ask them to incorporate it um, either as a mandatory measure or we give them technical assistance in order to do it. That's basically um, how we work through it. And it's available on our website if you want to see it. Ana Maria, I, I, we cannot hear you. Sí, no te escuchamos, Ana Maria. Díganle que ahora sí, díganle a eso, que se saquen los auriculares. Ok. So we had, I had an issue with the mic. I would like to ask our panelists, Natalie, Elena, Nora, for their contributions, because the messages that we have received are many in terms of the role of the private sector, in terms of connecting the planning and policy projects at national levels with the uh, climate change negotiations before the framework convention, uh, the issue of quantifying adaptation costs, uh, adaptation funding and skills to respond to all of this. Thank you very much to all of you, all our 50 
participants. The idea would be to continue our discussion and I will now give the floor to Maria Inés uh, for her to tell us uh, how we move ahead uh, in terms of the dialogue of climate adaptation. We would like to thank uh, the chair, the panelists. I would like to take this opportunity to invite all of you to meet on Thursday to our next webinar at one o'clock Uruguay time. And the objective of this webinar would be to talk about the IPCC role, the political uh, and policy projects uh, towards report seven, the possibility to appoint authors to increase the participation of scientists uh, in the Americas. So I would like to thank you again for your participation. Uh, UNEP and PLOS Climate, thank you all. Thank you. Bye-bye.